the second um, the, the second presentation uh, is from Olivia Jenkins. Uh, he, he, uh, Jenkins is a AAAS fellow uh, at the National Oceanic uh, and Atmospheric Administration at the present time, and we'll do that for a couple of years. We're very interested in. Um, uh, green technologies, and we'll talk about engineering for a sustainable future. Thank you. So, I'm going to talk about engineering for a sustainable future, and I think um, I'm going to show you a film trailer, which really sets the stage for why this is important, why this matters. Um, this is a film called The 11th Hour. It just received the Earthwatch Film Award last month at the Environmental Film Festival in D.C. Not only is it the 11th hour, it's 11.59. What we saw with Katrina was just prologue. Worse is yet to come. The UN estimates that by the middle of the century, there may be 150 million environmental refugees. There are too many of us using too many resources too fast. The problem is that every living system is in decline, and the rate of decline is accelerating. The tragedy is the potential extinction of humankind. We face a convergence of crises, all of which are concern for life. Will our pivotal generation create a sustainable world in time? People need to realize there are things they can do in their everyday lives. Everybody making a change adds up to something meaningful. Our project today is the welfare of all of life as a practical objective. With existing technologies, we could literally reduce the human footprint on planet Earth by 90%. We have to imagine what it would be like to redesign design itself. Okay. So that's the dilemma. We are all aware of it. And this quote, we have to imagine what it would be like to redesign design itself. What does that mean? What it means is our current way of going about inventing traditional technologies is insufficient to get us where we need in terms of inventing green technologies. And so we have to rethink that. Why do we need to rethink that? Because traditional technologies, the automobile, light bulb, telephone, are categorically different than <coughs> green technologies. They're different because the challenges that we face in inventing those things are different, and thus the solutions to solve those challenges are different. One example is that with traditional technologies, the device often precedes the need. So when people were driving their horse and buggies, they had no need for the horseless carriage, for the automobile. It was invented first, and then we convinced people why they wanted this thing. But with green technologies, the need comes first. And because the need comes first, there's a whole different driver. So drivers for traditional technologies, profit, fame, that's why we're going out and inventing new things. With green technologies and environmental crisis, the drivers, in addition to profit and fame, are often this critical need. We have a crisis we have to, to address. And a lot of times there's also a legislative mandate. For example, Congress could decide we're capping carbon emissions, and over the next two decades, the automobile industry must reduce them by 70%. So they're legislating someplace we need to be. The technologies may not exist yet, and now it behooves the automobile industry. You've got to figure out how to get there. So because the drivers are different, then what we're focusing on in our design and our engineering also changes. When you have a traditional technology and you're aware of the fact you're going to have to convince people that they want this, they need this, you're thinking about the total package. You're not just thinking about will this work, but you're also thinking about will it be affordable, will it be appealing, because you know you're going to have to market it. But with these green technologies that we need so badly, people think less about the marketing. And so what you might end up with is a device that might be mechanistically or economically viable, but not socio-politically viable. So let's do an exercise here that I think might get to some of this. And this is not a case study that I've studied, but I think it's very illustrative, um, hypothetical. So who in this room has ever thought about buying a hybrid car? Just raise your hands. Okay, put them down. Who knows what the Prius is? Seen the Prius? Okay. Who knows the Insight? Honda Insight. Okay, now I'm going to need about, keep those hands up, the Honda Insight people. And notice how, how many fewer know what the Honda Insight is. I need a volunteer. Anyone? Okay, yes. Um, if you had a choice of buying the Honda Insight or the Prius, which would you buy, regardless of price, just what would be your preference? I would have to go by price, I'm sorry. Well, let's say that you, someone will give you the money to buy whichever one you wanted. You just won it on a game show. You get to pick the Prius or the, or the Insight. Which one would you buy? Well, I've heard of Prius. Okay. 
Do you have any reasons behind that other than the fact you just heard of it? No. Anybody else have any reasons behind why they might choose a Prius over the inside? Yes, yeah, right here. Insight is really ugly. Okay, excellent. You help me out. So if you look at the <laughs> if you look at the Honda Insight, it was the first hybrid car on the market, and they had their eye focused on the need. We need fuel efficiency. So what did they do? They made it small. They made it light. They made it aerodynamic. Great, right? We're getting to, to what we need. But what does small, light, and aerodynamic mean? Small means no footroom. Light means a lot of plastics in the interior. Aerodynamic means it looks like a little bug, like an Escort or an Omni. It's not attractive. It's ugly. So who does this appeal for to? It appeals to the environmental diehards, the ones who only care about the fuel efficiency. And what, and this is my projection of the Honda, but what I think that they forgot about that in this country, cars have social status. And if you ignore that, then people aren't going to want to buy it. You know, and so Prius, they got it right. They kept their eye on the total package. They have a car that has social status. You can fit you and three of your friends in it comfortably. It doesn't look like a little bug. It's a cool car. And so that's why so many people want it, and that's why it, it, it has succeeded. So I'm not going to talk about theory and methods, but let's just leave it to say that there's rigorous theoretical and methodological um, underpinnings for this research. And if you have any interest in any of this stuff, I will be willing to talk to you about it later. So what I study is a type of green technology that I like to call green conservation technology, so used in fisheries. And there's two case studies that I've used. One is called turtle and scooter devices, tents. And basically it's an escape hatch that's placed in the net that allows endangered sea turtles to escape uh, shrimp nets because they get caught in them and they'll be trapped and drowned because they can't surface the reef. And the other case study of dolphin conservation technologies, and when we're in the process of catching tuna, sometimes you end up catching dolphins in those nets, they become entangled and they drown. So I'm going to show you a brief video of a TED in process. This little lump right here was a turtle. This is a TED, it's a grid. The water force will keep the shrimp moving through the grid into the net, but the larger turtle will hit that grid and come up through this uh, hole in the net and will be able to swim to freedom like this little guy is doing. Yay, freedom. <laughs> so what I'm going to do is I'm going to just focus on one small aspect of inventing green, green technologies, and that's going to be the end users. So how many people in this room are engineers of any sort? Okay, keep your hands up. How many people create things that have an end use in society? Do you create new medicines, vaccines? Do you want to create new medicines, vaccines, or are you in the process of becoming an engineer? Hands up, hands up. Okay, we have a few in this room. Now, of those people, how many of you involve end users in your process, in the research design? Do you have them on an advisory panel? Anybody in the room involve end users? A couple, I see some. So, I don't have time to talk to you. I'd like to have some of you say something, but I just want you to think about why you do things the way you do. Why you include end users, why you don't, and what points you do, and keep that in the back of your mind. So in these case studies, the National Marine Fisheries Service, called NIMS, which is a federal agency that manages fisheries, did want to involve fishermen. And they brought them into the process using this really broadcast approach. They went to big group meetings and said, hey, we'd like your help. They put out literature pamphlets they distributed that put in uh, ads in the newspaper, and they got some responses. And the fishermen that were involved were mostly involved as captain and crew of vessels they used to test the prototypes. Um, but the captain and crew, the fishermen that were working this way, weren't very satisfied. They, they felt like their ideas that they could contribute to improving these devices weren't heard and that they were treated as second-class citizens. Um, some of them went out on their own to invent conservation technologies, but this was very difficult because they didn't have the resources the government had. They didn't have the time, they didn't have the money, they didn't have the underwater cameras and the scuba divers, so they had a whole other process. Um, and there was really two different cultures here. The NIMS scientists, most of them had advanced degrees in biology or other sciences. Many of the fishermen, the average education in these fisheries is nine years or less. So another quick survey. If you had to place a bet on who invented the most successful conservation technologies, the government scientists or the fishermen, who would you bet for? People, fishermen, okay, you guys like the underdogs, so do I. And your bet would have been a good one. So with the TED case study, this, this chart um, basically shows the most successful TEDs. Um, as you go up the chart, they become more successful. You can see there's more shrimpers, which are types of fishermen, on this chart than anything else. They're also loaded towards the top, up near success. 
And in the most successful category, this purple one, even though we see shrimpers only once, actually shrimpers play a key or critical role in the invention of all these technologies. So they have the goods. They know how to do this. Same thing is true of dolphin conservation technologies. Again, the fishing industry invented the, the gross majority of these technologies. But we see here that the government scientists play a really critical role in modifying these devices. So here are some of the findings. We know expert users, these end users, are great inventors, that these government scientists, engineers, are great modifiers. Um, but this also indicates they have two different invention processes. And because those, those processes differ, they had different levels of success in the various roles. So the reason why this was is that because the fishermen didn't have access to all the research and all the um, resources and, and uh, experimental equipment, they did something called mental modeling. They would actually build a prototype in their head and then put it through a simulation. They would hypothetically say, well, what if I was fishing in these conditions? What would happen to this device? Would there be a problem? Oh, yeah, there might be a problem with this. And then mentally they go and tweak it, find a, a solution for that. Do that several times before they actually build a device. And in doing that, it allows them to move very quickly through the invention process. Whereas government, because they had the resources, built little prototypes for each step of the way, because that's how you do it, the cell scientists do it. We're, we're very much hard for <coughs> data, but it slows us down. And again, we have this critical need. We have these legislative mandates. We have a time frame when it comes to green technologies. So this mental modeling allowed fishermen to move quickly, but you get to a point where you're making fine-scale adjustments where you no longer can um, make these adjustments just in your head. You know? So you need, that, uh, you, you need those fine-scale prototypes, and that's how they could have had a symbiotic relationship, but they didn't because they marginalized the fishermen because they didn't have that education. They didn't respect them as, as peers. Okay, so what can we do about it? Best practices. One, you need to have qualified collaborators. And that doesn't mean people with credentials, doesn't mean people with titles, doesn't mean people with reputations. It means people that have the expertise that can bring to the table to fix the problem. And how do you find these people? One, you profile the people who are successful. I did this for the fishing uh, conservation technologies and found that a successful inventor, one, has a lot of experience fishing, two, has experience fabricating things, building their own boats, repairing their own nets, um, and then you use this, this profile to identify those individuals. You just don't broadcast and ask for volunteers. And that will, be, that will be very tempting because you're on this time frame, someone volunteers, okay, we're going to move with you, we're going to work with you. But if they don't have the expertise you need, you need in the long run, it's going to slow you down. You recruit those people. Once you recruit them, you get them to have faith in the process and have buy-in. They want to feel like that their advice matters and is having some effect. But you as a scientist are probably going to say to me, but I have certain needs that I need to keep. I'm a scientist. I need to manage some things. Okay, give them authority over their, their areas. So the uh, expert users panel can make decisions about when you bring a prototype to be tested by the user community. They can act as a conduit between the two groups, okay? And then finally, give the scientists and engineers institutionalized skunk works. Let them get off this fast track to finding the green technologies to spend time and have freedom to work on those ideas that might be a revolutionary leap where the, 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 the uh, value of it isn't immediately available. So give them that. Um, take home message. People cause environmental problems. And people are going to be the solution. So thus, end users that have significant involvement in the invention of green technologies because they have valuable expertise that can yield more effective and appealing devices. And thank you to my uh, participants and my funders. Time for a couple of questions. Okay, I'll take that news I did a good job. You did a great job. <laughs>